We're ready to do this experiment. Uh, you, you need to be kind of close to the microphone. <coughs> close enough? Yes, but now I think there is something else. Uh, try again. Try what? <laughs> Closer. Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we Okay, should we do this? Yes. You're ready? Everybody's ready? The room is ready? We're boxed into this <laughs> corner? <laughs> so let's do this. Um, so welcome to the first ever Café con Paolo Freire, Coffee with Paolo Freire podcast. Um, and we've been doing this series, um, Asrila and me, since 2021. So it's been almost three years. Yeah, two, three years. Um, and we had different kinds of meetings. We've basically almost every time been here in Simus Library in Uppsala, but also had an online connection most of the times. And we had very few people. We had a lot of people. Uh, we've done very different themes. Uh, and the connection to Paulo Freire may sometimes have been vague or <laughs> loose. Um, but that was the starting point in the 100-year anniversary of Paolo Freire's birth, right? Yeah. Uh, man, yes. Yes. So, but we should introduce ourselves. Uh, so, I'm uh, Daniel Mosby, uh, and I work here at CMOS uh, as outreach and educational coordinator, supporting the student-led education. Um, and CMOS is a joint university center at, or not a joint anymore. It's a Uppsala University joint university center. I shouldn't mix that up. Uh, so that is the very brief, and my background is mainly in the cultural anthropology, sustainability, CMS courses. And you, Asriel, uh, a short introduction, and then we can get into a longer one as well. Um, mm. Well, I am 82, going to 83, surprised by every second. As I was walking here, saying, wow, I am alive, it's a beautiful day. So... Yeah, if you get to be 82, then you are more than half what Mozart lived and hoping that you have done something meaningful like Mozart did before he died. Um, so my background is in agricultural engineering. I mean, I've done economics, sociology, um, and I guess um, as a father of three children, grandfather to six grandchildren. Um, I'm concerned about the state of the world, not to the extent to be worried and paralyzed, but to the extent that I wish to drop my drop of water in the ocean of possibilities to try to live a better world to the coming generations, kind of like that. Perfect. Um, and we should say something more also about the podcast and the podcast format. Uh, and I'm going to just read uh, and, and summarize here. This is Daniel. Yes. <laughs> so there's two of us. I'm realizing now also the, the setup we have with the video is, <laughs> it looks like we're miles apart and <laughs> we're staring into the... Uh, the horizon, but never mind, it's mostly a listening experience. Um, so as I said, we wanted to do this as a podcast, so we have this recorded, basically podcast is radio, um, but we wanted to keep the components of having a conversation, both between us, but also guests that we will bring in later uh, in this series, uh, but also for people online, they can join us in that online studio or people here in Samus Library, so just call this the studio, uh, although this is a joint space for other things happening. Uh, and basically, we provide coffee and tea if you show up here in Uppsala and join us. And if you're online, that's that's totally up to you. Uh, but I just wanted to read this text. I don't know if you, you looked at it uh, in more in detail, Azrael, but I'm going to read it anyway. So this is kind of the, the uh, starting point uh, of the po podcast and asking some questions. We're trying to frame what it is about. Um, and we had the subtitle as well, Learning, Life and Liberation, which I think 
captures some of the things we'll try to deal with. So basically, uh, I wrote this. Are you a teacher in search of more inclusive and democratic ways to engage your students? Armchair digital activist looking for real-world change-making processes and community? Or just curious about the connection between coffee, student-led education, Freire, and today's interconnected emergencies? Then this is the podcast for you. Um, and it's promising a lot that we will be talking in a way that people can actually translate this into something practical but maybe we can be better at that uh, <laughs> and uh, not just uh, talking but actually talking in a way that makes it practical for for people out there uh, and maybe also try to, we would try to be focused on on topic <laughs> which will be difficult and hard but i wanted to start in a way because uh, uh, you have a long life experience as really you've uh, lived in many different places and different parts of the world uh, you met uh, an enormous amount of people uh, throughout the years uh, working on the issues basically that CMS uh, have been working on uh, so and I'm curious we have uh, the other podcast that CMS and, and then we always have we have just one question that we ask at the start and then we build from there uh, and that question is basically what in life led you down this path um, and now this path is long and winding in your case, but something more uh, uh, about your life, how you came to Uppsala, uh, and also how you came in contact with Paulo Freire and the pedagogics and work of Paulo Freire. So <clears throat> it's not a single question, it's several questions in, in one. So I'll try to respond in kind. Um, I guess... I started looking at the problems of population, of food. Um, when I entered the National Agriculture University, La Molina in Lima, Peru, that's in the late 50s, early 60s, um, and then, soon enough, one was aware that the technology to feed the world was there, and yet the food wasn't getting to undernourished, hungry people. Um, and it was even overfeeding obesity in the rich parts of the world. So... The question is, if it's not the technology, uh, the agricultural technology, the know-how, the scientific, technical ways to look at agricultural production, yeah, today you will phrase it in terms of food security, food sovereignty, if you come from the social movement, from Via Campesinas, so it. Um, so a, a small group of, let's say, activist students, we were good students, quote, quote, um, in the agricultural sciences, but we simultaneously took agricultural economics and eventually economics, both uh, production economics, micro, macro, and even eventually I took a class on Marxian economics at the University of California in Santa Barbara. So that was the economic. The idea was that if the problem is not the production, something must be wrong in the distribution. And then you think of markets, if you want, but something that would enable the food being produced going to the hungry mouths or the needy, the undernourished. So, so that finished with my finishing studies in economics and say, mm -mm. Um, clearly the market since colonial times, capitalism, industrialism, hasn't solved the problem of, of hunger. At the time we were looking, comparing India and China, and we'll say, look, China has solved the food problem, India hasn't. Uh, so India is more democratic, quote-unquote, it was, not with Modi, uh, and China 
well, it's not democratic, but at least they are tackling the problem. So uh, that was the ideological fancies we had at the time. We read Jan Myrdal, uh, Apology of the Chinese uh, Revolution. We had read his father, Gunnar Myrdal's The Asian Drama, as an introduction to the quest for development. So that was kind of a Swedish connection, uh, unwittingly, unanticipated. So I said, if it's not the agricultural know-how, if it's not the economic, quote-unquote, science, that Gunnar Mirda will say, uh-uh, it's political economy, or it's betraying the reason of being of economics, which is political economics, political economy. So I went to sociology to try to understand the social processes, the way we organize, how we have a kind of social division of labor so that things are organized to deliver, to deliver the kind of mess we find ourselves today where we are at portas uh, of a potential third world war that then will make the fourth world war redundant and needed. Um, we find ourselves in a critical mess, call it global boiling, as Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, speaks about. You take 100 million refugees, a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, today I read that now Pakistan wants to expel one and a million half uh, refugees, so we'll add 101, 102 million refugees not being managed. We find a crisis of democracy, both liberal and social democracies, kind of a rebirth, or maybe coming to the front, coming out of the closet, of what Umberto Eco called el eterno fascismo, the eternal fascism that is there. And so maybe we read about Argentina and this crazy fascist that calls the Pope an incarnation of Satanas, of Satan. Um, now we have one in Mexico coming up to the fore. So we're having a multiple crises, a complex crisis situation where one really needs to look at complexity, if not from the phenomenological viewpoint, from a multi-inter-transdisciplinary way, if we speak about research, about university, about high, uh, um, yeah, higher uh, education, and, and so on. So I guess I just follow my questions about, which are your questions when you raise them to me, about how to make sense of the world and do something about it, not just contemplate, not just be erudite eunuchs with knowledge, but a way to have practical knowledge produced by research university centers for the common good. And this is not as common as we wish to have it, because we live at a time also of a crisis of the university, as Ryan, just facing me, just talked yesterday <coughs> about the neoliberalized, never liberalized university, that is an absurd university, as we have written about uh, in, in different texts. I don't know if that's enough for beginning answer. That's a good answer, and I can just, uh, I mean, how do we, how do we build Paulo Freire's work and pedagogics into this? How could a a different pedagogic, so basically pedagogics is a fancy word for just saying how you organize education or how you organize your classes. How could we do education differently? Uh, and Siemens, with inspiration from Freire and a lot of others, have one part of the answer perhaps. Uh, but from your experience of Paulo Freire's work, 
What would you say be the main bullet points? Okay. Um, even Samus, the occasions I've had to teach at courses organized by Samus students, I was able to <coughs> to apply Freire. So let's go to be the beginning. I discovered Freire when invited to teach uh, extension for faculty of animal husbandry. And then I found the text, extension or communication. So that was my entry point. And this was in the 60s. But that text should still be read because it's so bloody actual, its message. Basically, Freire criticized uh, traditional agricultural extension for being monological. Monological means the psychology of communication of persuasion. I have the knowledge, I will persuade you about the right track. Um, so that's propaganda, if it's political. Publicity, how to make you thirst for Coca-Cola, not for clean water. Um, education. A lot of education historically and currently it's education for conformity, for obedience, rather than for free thinking, autonomy and creativity. Um, <clears throat> in contrast to monological communication, like extension, um, Freire coined uh, communication, like dialogue, dialogic communication. So you could trace it all the way to Socrates. He was influenced a lot by Martin Buber, the Ian Dao, by Mounier from the Catholic dialogic tradition. <clears throat> But a, a lot of the Mayeutic, the Socratic input. Um, so that's how I came in uh, on the theoretical level. But on the practical level, <laughs> it was a tough assignment by Freire himself. 68, we experienced in Peru maybe the most radically reformist, not revolutionary, because it was run by military that liked to control. So maybe their need to control made the experiment fail. From 68 to 74, we had Juan Velasco Alvarado, a little bit like the Nasser revolution in Egypt, um, along the lines of non-aligned countries. So at that time, Peru was very active also in the international scene. So 69 on the 24th of June, we heard Juan Velasco Alvarado in the main square, I was there sitting in the taxi, both of us crying. This was the law of agrarian reform, where Velasco quotes Tupac Amaru II, saying, El patrón no comerá más tu pobreza. Patrón won't eat anymore from your poverty. And it came from the heart, and We're actually listening, crying. So, what happens? The university, the National Agricultural University, like SLE in Sweden, send us to support this agrarian reform process or the, the changes that were taking place. So, so it happened that <laughs> um, I was responsible to coordinate the first national meeting from 12 agricultural area zones of Peru to discuss how are we going to proceed to train peasants and agrarian agents for for uh, agrarian reform. So I still have this document, uh, it's a historical document, uh, prehistorical maybe. And then we decided that we would go uh, along the lines of Paulo Freire. Um, It happened that when Freire was exiled from Brazil in the mid-60s, 63, 64, there was a military coup associated with the 
beginning of neoliberalism, not with Pinochet. Pinochet is step, step number two. When the Chicago Boys, Milton Friedman, became the mantra of development, and if you read Naomi Klein, then it was also the shock doctrine. People were so shocked by this military violence and terror that they didn't react to all the kind of macroeconomics being replaced by microeconomics, basically to maximize profit at any cost and reducing cost as much as possible. This is what became the name of the game. So Freire was Minister of Education, had went into exile with a group of Brazilians, and he worked in ISIRA, the Institute of Research and Training for Agrarian Reform. And they came to Peru with the FAO, United Nations Mission, to support the Peruvian process. So Freire and some of his team came. Freire went to support mostly the uh, uh, literacy, the literacy campaign, um, Alfin, with a, an incredible uh, Minister of Education, philosopher, Augusto Salazar Bondi, but he came to us while we were tr- brainstorming how to, how to um, work, how, how to train. The target was, if I don't remember mistaken, half a million uh, 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 rural families. You multiply this by seven, eight. It was a big task, big population. So Freire just said, <laughs> use mass media in a dialogical way. Goodbye. So he left us with a task. So, <laughs> so, so we did create um, a project, a model that we call Peasant Radio Forums, and it, it, this still is waiting to be written. If I ever, ever stop and find the time to do it, I have the documents to do that. And so I will not go into detail how, how to proceed, but we looked at experiences in India, in Canada, uh, in Ghana. Um, so it was a kind of pioneer. The, the, uh, the main shift in the traditional models of radio forums were that instead of dividing the source of the messages and the audience, we had the audience organized, represented at the source. So it was not us, the expert, making the messages, but in dialogue, we, the external team and the local teams, working together in the best project I think this was historical success. In one month, it was cooperative with 220 families, but they were urban, coastal people that were educated. They managed the whole project themselves without extra external support. So that became like a school for the rest of Peru. So this should be actually written some sometime. Anyway, so that was a grand reform. In the 70s, uh, the, I applied Freire, uh, and I can say I wasn't too shy, I guess I've been adventuresome all my life, in dealing with something called in UNESCO and advocated by the African Liberation uh, movements uh, in the decolonization process in Africa, uh, the process was called how to decolonize uh, colonized identities. And this takes us to Franz Fanon, to Albert Memmi, and others. And in UNESCO, the guy in charge was Leo Cooper, whom I had met before when he was president of the World Federation of Mental Health, because I had worked in social psychiatry. So that work was concentrated on Latinos, on Chicanos, 250 hours of uh, praxis, and Freire was one of the key components, because, again, uh, therapy can be also domesticating and normalizing. So conventional therapy 
might still try to make you normal, quote unquote. Um, and here we're speaking about transforming identities that are contestatory, that are not complicit or victims of racist conditioning. So this was 70s. In the 80s, uh, Freire was taken to a project that is now being renewed in Mexico into peasant communities where I was invited, I guess, as an extensionist. But when they asked me what I was going to do, I very honestly, I wrote five pages. I'm going to do Paulo Freire. I'm not going to do the classical extensionism. So... Just a couple of weeks ago, I was conversing with the technical director of, of this project, who is the only researcher on the world I know that they have made a statue alive. Uh, uh, Antonio Turrent, I think, is one of the top soil and mice specialists on, in the world. So I stayed one night with him. We studied together in Iowa State. He used to play the guitar, I used to sing with him rancheras. So there it was. Um, and, you know, biography and history intersect. So to my surprise, his wife, Marty, from Iowa, had a copy of the wedding, my first wedding with my first wife, American wife. And, and then I said, how come you had this? picture I don't have it you know so it was in the trunk so life in a way has this kind of ways of crossing roads um, so that's the 80s but I've been teaching uh, Paulo Freire pedagogics in Mexico for the last over 20 years in different places in Tijuana and Ensenada Baja California I've been teaching peace education using Paulo Freire since 72 ish um, um, I'm still in the staff in Sipae, Puebla um, doing that um, and maybe I finish by saying that uh, from the 17th to the 19th of September this year we had the 12th World Forum Paulo Freire in Cuernavaca, Mexico and then we had the coffee with Paulo Freire, uh, Freire, with Daniel. We had together, because we had two different links, about 14 people. And uh, yesterday, I sent my contribution in Spanish on the pedagogy of peace, my reflections on this book <coughs> by Alessandro Gallardi, who invited me to write an epilogue, and this is the basis for the reflections and my contribution with her permission. So you could say that um, it's a long trajectory where my past with Freire before I met him in person, 60s, also 74, he was in Sweden, and I happened then to be in Sweden, um, then has to do with peace education, but not not the peace, not Pax Romana, not the peace of the pacified, but the kind of active peace, including civil disobedience uh, and nonviolent action. So I don't know if that's a long answer. That's a good and long answer. But you also brought some some photos, and we maybe we can't go through all of them, but it would be nice if you have. One or two photos okay. from this long period you described? Well, this is a picture of poetry. One of the things I do, there you go. Uh, of, that I do um, to make sense of the world, when my abstract mercurial mind doesn't suffice, I do poetry. Because sometimes poetry can give you insights as you write it down. Um, so here it's a picture of my parents, uh, myself as a child, and now you can recognize me with my hat and my beard, yes? So, uh, poetry, and I could say something else. Um, how come I became engaged 
from day one at the university, in the student movement, in social movements, in the peace movement, in the environmental justice movement, in the climate movement, in the World Social Forum. I think I have to thank my father. My father spent two years in jail for his political convictions. He was very nonviolent, one of the sweetest poetry writing, violin playing, doing theater. And he was concerned about injustice in the world. So maybe unwittingly uh, that came to me as I was growing up, maybe. Uh, and connecting back also to Paulo Freire and his work, I think for Semus, uh, and putting Semus in a context with Paulo Freire, I think it starts with how you view other human beings and how you view yourself. Because if you as a teacher see yourself as the sole bearer of knowledge and everybody else entering the room or the learning situation as receivers of that knowledge then you're going to start out and build something that is fundamentally different from how yes. Freire saw it and how yes. CMS has also tried to build courses, but also having a student-led educational model or practice that CMS works with, with employing students, students designing courses, inviting guest lectures, and making this mix of things. You make good questions, Daniel. <laughs> so you're referring to the critique that Paulo Freire did to conventional education, meaning education for conformity, for docility, for obedience. He called that banking system of education, where you have a division of labor between, you know, people that know it all, the experts sitting on one trench in the room, and then the not the imbeciles, but the empty heads, the the recipients of this valuable treasure of knowledge from the teacher. And he said, uh-uh, that doesn't stand to, to what I see as education. Education is co-learning. You learn as you teach, you teach as you learn. So it's co-learning. And then he also didn't distinguish teaching from doing research because he saw it as two sides of the same coin. So he broke the elitism between researchers, smart researchers, not so smart subjects of research, being research, objects of research, by speaking about co-researching. So you can see on that line then is the co-creation of knowledge, but again, knowledge for the common good not knowledge for the privileged few. Freire was very adamant about returning culture, knowledge, education, science to the people. Uh, th there was once upon a time an organization called Science for the People uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a commitment, it's a value commitment same as Gunnar Myrdal had it, a value entry into research and higher education that emphasizes the common good. Yeah, and I think also, I mean, the educational context is where I mainly worked as well, but, but I think this goes for any kind of human interaction that we endeavor on. So if you have activists gathering for a meeting, there's going to be certain people that know certain things more about how to do things, but uh, you can't really assume that everybody else will be those empty receivers of your own wisdom and knowledge. So, so it could be translated to basically any human interaction and how yes. we organize our work and how everybody um, in their own way can contribute um, but but if you start out from that uh, in a very practical sense, what you do together becomes different as well. And also how you physically organize the room, how you're seated, how you just organize who speaks when. So I think that's an important point and it's been important for, for CMS as well. Yes, indeed. Freire spoke about the geometry of the classroom being an oppressive geometry. So he prefers what 
at the time in northeast Brazil, where because he worked very close with the peasant leagues, Juliao, for, uh, for example, uh, with uh, circles. And in a circle, everyone has the same value. Everyone has the same opportunity and time to speak out. So it's not a geometry that silences uh, people's voices. It invites all the voices, all the diversity, even the shy ones. Okay, you are shy? Okay, take your time, think. We'll give you time. I mean, it's not fascist participation, but we encourage people and changes take place. Mm. Shy people begin to speak and people speak too much, like myself, speak less. So, I want to answer to that because it is in Spanish. I wish it could be more accessible. Um, this chapter in a book, um, <clears throat> Why Another Education is Possible, like Samos, Contributions to a Transformatory Praxis. Um, this was published by the Paulo Freire Institute in Portugal. Uh, the coordinator was Eunice Macedo, very creative teacher herself, and she invited me to write about exactly what you said, about social educational ways to intervene, which means every imaginable episode, interaction, space, time, the bathroom, your bed, your bedroom, your family, it's a space where you can reproduce the old world that is unsustainable, or you can make inflections and bring innovations and changes that transform the old into new, another possible world the way we envision it, you know, with solidarity instead of competition, with peace instead of war, um, decent, world for all human beings and so on so here I've tried to summarize it is in Spanish but maybe someday we could translate it to English and Swedish because I think I've tried to make sense of your question uh, and again from the small if one can see oneself as an um, onion so, so we have concentric uh, yeah, whatever context surrounding condition in us at the same time we can activate as soon as we read the condition in, in us and get rid of the internalized enemy so that we can actually love our neighbor like ourselves because if we don't love ourselves if we have this internalized enemy then we do what's happening now in Sweden, now it's big news we have criminal gangs, violence, and so on. And, and, and why? Because this structural, vertical violence that Gandhi spoke about, the violence of inequality, of poverty, is being displaced, is being horizontalized. So instead of taking the violence to change the system, then people are killing themselves at home, in neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. So, um, Fred really had um, a very holistic approach to the complexity we live today. So it's, you could say it's very actual. And his boss in Geneva was a Swedish theologian, Hans Persson, and I interviewed him. He said, Freire is very much needed today. Yes, he is very much needed today. I agree. Um, and I thought I... Uh highlight these as well, or that's the same book in Swedish and English, um, this is what we call the, the Sims book, Transcending Boundaries, uh, and it is the story of basically um, how Sims started, um, and also why Sims started, so I think that story in a very short version of it is basically, it was two students that came to Uppsala to study biology, uh, 
Uh, and both of them, I think, had a vision of the university as being a very creative place, a very active place, a lot of things happening, but also expecting that not only to happen outside of the classes, but actually in the education itself. And also that education, um, in this case biology, would also address current issues around environment and other issues they cared about. And since this wasn't the case, this was... Uh, long time ago, 35 years ago, uh, they themselves then thought, well, if it's not done now at the university within this formal education that we're taking in biology, uh, why don't we make a course, uh, a freestanding course, an evening course that all students from the whole of, all over the university can take uh, that brings in different guest lectures, during, brings in different perspectives and different uh, issues uh, in environment and development as they focused on. Um, so that was the origin story that there is a potential within the university, there's a potential in education, but there's certain issues or certain topics that is not discussed enough. So then after 35 years, you could say like, well, now everybody's talking about sustainability or climate and uh, all sorts of other things. So, so what then is the need uh, of this type of education? But I think it's a lot of words and talking about sustainability and I think it's a lot of attracting students to courses then again I think there's a lot of teachers who actually do great work on sustainability at Uppsala University but I think there is there is a huge difference in how you organize education around these issues um, and and how CMS have been doing it also for the all these years so so it's important to add that as well thank you Daniel <coughs> so let me show you first uh, this book. It's part of an inter-university journal for uh, the training of teachers in Spain. There. So it is in Spanish. The abstract is in English. So maybe I can read the abstract. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was edited by... Vicente Manzano Arronda. He was acknowledged as the best psychology teacher in Spain, uh, the Universi Universidad de Sevilla, Seville University. So, this is how we phrase it. University and social movements. The absurd university and the hope gained from the university street social movement praxis. Uh, and at one time, SEMUS was a platform for Uppsala Social Forum. For about eight, ten years, we were able to gather all social movements, organizations in Uppsala, and it was very good to have a platform like SEMUS. So, the abstract. The university constitutes a privileged space to contribute in the creation of other possible worlds primarily intended to enhance the so-called common good. Rather, it can be found being emerging processes which deny its mission and to such a counterproductive degree that it may be considered an absurd university. At the same time, a rainbow of overall social movement emerges, being much closer to the human longing for the common good with a deep action experience. The confluence between university and social movements might be open a door to hope as a powerful and mixed hybrid decisively oriented towards another possible world. So that's it. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah. And this one uh, was launched from Samos. Uh, it's a book by Emerald that apparently sold good enough, even though it was bloody expensive, as a hardcover. They would come out with a paperback on transformative research and higher education. It's an anthology. Um, and then Samos gave me the platform to, to launch it as an editor. So uh, this, yeah, we'll, we want to translate to Spanish to make it available. Um, I won't go into details. But thanks, Samos, that it is, it is there. 
And I think also we we should add, or I should add also with CMS and how it started is that the story continued in the way that the uh, vice chancellor, they put forward the suggestion for a course to the vice chancellor. He put it back to the students. There was more than two students. It was a student group, basically, that why don't you run the course? Why don't you put it together? And there was also funding. So already from the start, the university had resources. Uh, there was formal student registrations and people were formally employed um, there were students and also employed at the university to put together and plan the courses. And then also there was a budget to actually invite guest lecturers uh, to come in and give uh, lectures once a week then, and different people coming in on Monday evenings uh, when this ran. And it was also, that was one key factor. But also the other key factor was that it was over 400 students that applied to, to take the course. I think there was 200 seats in the room in uh, room 10 at the university main building. So, so it was this merge of a different, it was a basically a need for these, this kind of type of courses, but also just a place to be able to discuss uh, what they call the world's survival issues, if I do a very rough translation from Swedish. Uh, so I think that all came together in the early 90s, and then there was the meeting in Rio, uh, the environmental UN meeting in 92, and there was the start of the Kyoto process. And was other international uh, meetings happening, which then also evolved during the 90s and the late 90s uh, into the uh, world, the protests against the World Trade Organization and IMF, uh, Seattle and Genoa, and then that all kind of died down with uh, 9/11 and the attacks in the U.S. So, so there is. It's interesting in in building on your history or the things you started off with from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and then going into this period as well, where CMS started and CMS emerged, and then also how CMS and this type of education, uh, or different initiatives around uh, CMS, how, what is our role now in 2023? It feels, maybe <laughs> it just happens over time, but it feels like the world has changed so much it always changes in some way. Uh, and also, what are the things we are not doing here at CMS or the university or in a privileged position in general? What are the things we're not doing and what are the contacts we're not making uh, that we should be making? Um, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yesterday, Ryan, sitting with us, mentioned the... Humboldt University, and then I had a small comment that has to do with Freire again. Um, could say that what today is known as public education, including higher education, it's related to the national state project, to the project that could be linked to the French Revolution or uh, more to Napoleon. So uh, the functional aim of the Napoleonic University was basically to create uh, bureaucrats to run the apparatus of the national state. And then you had theologians, uh, you had, you know, that's early science, uh, medical sciences, and, and so on and, and so forth. And then the Kaiser uh, in, in Germany invited Humboldt, this you know famous two brothers, but this is Wilhelm uh, Humboldt, to start the Freie University, which was to be a free university to invite free thinking, still in elitist terms. Okay, eventually you had also the Frankfurt model of university where you combined uh, both Freud and psychoanalysis and Marxism. Then you had the Frankfurt Critical School of Social Sciences, some of it still alive, some of it. Some moved to New York after the Nazis, the New York School of Social Research, and so on and so forth. But I was very surprised once in Berlin where the question was raised, where was located the first office of education in the public service in Germany? And then the answer was in the Ministry of Interior. So 
what is the Ministry of Interior? That's, you know, yeah, whatever, all the way from social control to secret police. But basically, how to engineer obedient citizenship. So that was interesting. So the idea of social control and education is very central to Freire. So when he's challenging the kind of education system for obedience, he's challenging the status quo. And people like Bolsonaro, before he was elected president, and fortunately he won't be re-elected, but he's still a pain in the ass, uh, he said, I will burn Freire's books if I get elected. He's tried his best to criminalize Freire's. Why? Because Freire wants to invite us to be who we are, to think freely, to speak freely, to discuss freely, to create special temporal conditions to do it. So on that score, somebody was against Freire's idea uh, of um, the schools being for autonomy and freedom because Freire wrote about pedagogy of autonomy, that's a big book, and freedom. Not in the selfish way that pseudo-libertarians like Margaret Thatcher and Reagan speak about freedom, the selfish freedom. You know, me first, I compete, and then I win, you lose. Zero-sum games. No? For Freire, freedom was social. The more I encompass, the more I am myself. I realize my human potential. It's not in contradiction, the I with the we, as the West will phrase it, even Freud will do it. So Illich said, uh-uh. All schools, private or public, are elitist. They are bound to reproduce the elitism of the school system, uh, of, of society. And then Freire came in and said, well, it's a trench that we need to fight. So in this discussion came a book with a dialogue by them in Sidoc in Cuernavaca in Mexico. So that's one issue. So universities can also be seen as an extension of conventional absurd universities being used to distract bright people, to read lots of books, not to make noise in the street, not to make protests, not to join social movements, not to make revolutions, but for about, let's say, five, six, ten years, be busy with research, getting the degree, and not having time to think too much about other things. So... But then, 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 it's this proposal, these examples that today, in a Foucault, Foucault has one line I like a lot. It's like how we can use the interstitials of power to counteract point counterpoint, and universities can and have historically produced this kind of anomalies where people can think freely, contest, sometimes you get kicked out. I was kicked out from a private university being very well paid. I mean, and I took that risk. So you, you pay a cost sometimes, okay? Um, but then, then you can still say hello to yourself when you look at yourself in the mirror, having to do with our personal identity, and trying to be coherent as much as possible. We are not perfect, we'll never be perfect, but we can seek coherence and integrity. And then, if you're yourself, something might happen to others. Because if you are not yourself, you are not inviting other people to be themselves. So in this deep existential dialogue, something new can happen, which is fresh and promising. Yes, um, and what a time to be alive when book burning is back on the political agenda. That's uh, <laughs> you can take that as a the, negative, the Quran. <laughs> but it's also yeah, and the Bible, <laughs> yeah, all sorts of books. Um, yeah, and I think also we can talk more about identity. I don't know if we have time, but if you identify completely with a system, you're going to have very 
a very hard time changing that system or just seeing that system. Uh, and then also, what do you offer instead of identifying with a system? What, what is is it identifying with a certain certain type of living? Is it uh, individualism? Uh, but that's maybe a bigger topic. And and I think sometimes we can be very precise uh, and very wise in our critique of a system but offering practical alternatives or or offering up other ways of being we're not so good in general but also here at cms i think um do you want to dive into that or should i should we do a more general thing about the paulo freire forum uh that you were part of we both were part of maybe just a a short note Uh, i had um I'm schooled in anthropology also, so I have the uh, uh, Arizona Spicer School in Anthropology, which is basically good social anthropology. But a magnificent teacher, Greek, and this is important, the Greek part, because in Greek culture, you value the self, you value autonomy. This way, Greeks are known for discussion. And Dorothy Lee was the name, uh, Thora in in Greek. She was dealing with this um, dilemma in Western culture, the I um, is perceived, is phrased, is interpreted in terms of a separate I. You could say an alienated I. When she was saying... Um, in remote cultures, not primitive the way our Eurocentrism leads us to do. Uh, there's a lot to learn about this deep interplay between I-ness and we-ness. Uh, not in opposition, but being in a way synergic. Uh, extreme of I-ism would be autism where you live in your own sphere. Um, at the same time, uh, collectivism might, in whichever Soviet or Nazi fascist ways, they can limit your individuality, which is different from the individualistic I, ego. So that's a note on, on that aspect of identity. Um, and Maybe something you asked about my being in Sweden. Yeah. So, in the 70s, I read a paragraph, a short paragraph, in an American newspaper. I was living in Santa Barbara in California about this proposal in the Swedish parliament, the Riksdagen, to equalize income in five years. So, Uh, I said, I need to see that. That's the way I said, wow. And I think I may have been one of the first um, scholarship from the Swedish Institute. I, I'm pretty sure, I'm, if not the first, one of the first ones. So I got scholarship in the weeks, two weeks time to come through the Education Abroad program to Lund. And then I met Alva Gunnar Myrdal And that friendship continued until almost when they died. They came to Santa Barbara, and I think it was very important in his development of his ideas of democracy, because he came from corporate democracy, which was not so far away from fascism. That's, I'm speaking an anathema, <laughs> but I think that I'm right. He worked two years in the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara. So... That was the friendship with Alba Mirdal, Gunnar Mirdal. And then the incredible privilege to work with um, my God, Lon Tagar Fonden, uh, Lon Tagar Fonden, Rudolf Meiner, Rudolf Meiner, political economist, Austrian with Jewish background. He gave a shit about the background. He, uh, used, well, people knew about the Cambridge Keynes School of of Economics, but they did know about the Stockholm School of Economics, political economy, 
which was started by people like Gunnar Myrdal, and Rudolf was a disciple of. Now, I th think, I dread, I'm sorry, that Sweden didn't take the Lontager Fountain project, where the working part of the political economy equation would buy 49, 50, 51% of the Swedish enterprises. Because if Sweden would have taken this step, I think we would not be facing today in Sweden, in Europe, in the world, this return to fascism. There was a panic created on purpose by the media, Swedish media. Sweden is becoming Soviet. People went to the streets in panic. The media played a role, Timbro played a role. So the fact that we didn't take that step in Sweden, maybe in the future, the problem is that all the accumulated capital from the Swedish pensions, it's gone, it's fragmented by policy from the top. Uh, and uh, finally, we're going to let in everybody else if they want to have something to say. And I should say, I should have said this from the beginning, the microphones mostly picks this up, so you don't have to be super silent out there and <laughs> listening in. Uh, and the Zoom uh, mic is off. Uh, but I'm thinking also to, to wrap this up uh, because uh, you were part of the Paulo Freire Forum in Mexico City. I was listening in online w with my limited Spanish uh, knowledge. And then, as you said, we had... Uh, two separate uh, Café Con Paulo Freire, although we try to be in the same <laughs> same café. But but yeah, there were people showing up for both links. We had <laughs> some confusion there, uh, which was fun. I did an English version uh, with people <laughs> listening carefully, and uh, you did a Spanish yes. one. Yes, but is there any takeaways from that meeting? Because it was really yeah. interesting. It was uh, 150 yeah. people online on, on Sunday uh, when I listened in from all over the world, mainly Latin America, North and South America. So yeah. Yes, yes. Um, Freud is a lot about dialogue. So, uh, in our coffees, things happen that are unexpected, like now, today. So, I'm receiving today, yesterday, one of our participants in the Coffee with Pablo Freire in Spanish is Ivan from a state called Guerrero, very violent today. It's where criminal gangs are doing what they are doing in Sweden. They're fighting with each other. You know, they buy police. I don't know if this happens in Sweden. I would not be completely surprised. I don't want to offend Swedish police. But, um, you know, for them to go on so long, some complicity is must be found in the legal and police system as well. Uh, so, dialogue, okay, we had this discussion and suddenly we have these ongoing conversations that uh, and will continue into the future that is very enriching. He's like Ryan in philosophy, Ivan. Um, and I haven't had the time because I just came last Wednesday from Mexico, Sunday from the book fair. Uh, but I do intend to engage with him to the extent I'm... Uh, so, dialogue is something that it, it, it goes on. It opens horizons. It doesn't close them. And this is one of the insights from Martin Buber. He says, in dialogue, something new happens, which goes beyond the knowledge that the two alter had before. So, yes, we're contributing to the anthology coming out, uh, lots of contacts with people in different places. Uh, of course, you cannot meet everyone, but you meet some meaningful encounters. And uh, so I was surprised when the invitation for today's activity was translated to Portuguese yesterday in short notice. Mm. So it means that we are part of a process. We are not just 
in Samos, in Uppsala. Uh, this then is available to people. I got greetings from uh, Porto Alegre in Brazil. Um, and now I understand there are some people from Egypt and our Pakistani friend left us. But then maybe I should shut my big mouth and then have other mm. people partake. Yeah. And I think it also is that Samus in and it's a very small thing, but I think it just being there, we were the only ones from Europe, I think. The only ones uh, definitely from no. Uppsala. There was there other was people from Somebody Europe. from the Paulo Ferri Institute from Austria. Oh, that's good. That's David. good. Yeah, it yes. was a lot of people, so I didn't really collect yes. everybody. Yes. So, uh, and just being part of it and, yeah. and showing up. Um, but we can invite everybody. Um, if there's people online, we'll do this uh, trick uh, with the microphone and the speaker. It's easier in the room if somebody wants to, to ask a question or add anything. Uh, we've been going on for over an hour. Uh, so, so I yeah, we covered quite a lot. But uh, anybody in the room? Ask a question. Comment. Yes, and you need that microphone, and uh, yes, it's yes, and it's intimidating, um, but, <laughs> well, it's not on, so. <laughs> but they, uh, they cannot see Ryan. They will see Ryan when he speaks. Ah. Um, you can also lift the microphone up, you don't have to <laughs> be afraid of it. Yeah, that's good. Um, I guess I had... Conversation's quite uh, free, th free flowing, so it's easy to for forget every aspect of it. But I was thinking, one thing I've been thinking about a lot. You were talking about, um, obviously, Peru and the progressive things happening there in the '60s and various things happening around the world '70s and '80s as well. But like, um, I guess I can't help but think, uh, you know, and and Daniel, what you were saying about what we're experiencing now in 2023. What are we? What are we not doing? The world's changed, it feels like, in such a short period of time. Um, I guess I've been thinking, like, you know, post-World War II, there being this sort of balance of power, this third-way movement that created the space for countries to pursue, like, fairly alternative po policies by balancing between the East and the West, or the Rus Russia and, and capitalism, Soviet style and Western style. And, um, you know, there's obviously, like, a power struggle now a global power struggle and at the moment it doesn't look like it's going so well uh, and it does seem like war is kind of inevitable but like i guess i'm wondering like what are the what are the ways that we can act there to try and reproduce some sort of global not like a bipolar system of power but some sort of multi-powered system to create a bit of balance where maybe there is some space to pursue more um, policies at a national and a regional level that are, you know, a bit more about income inequality and environmental protection and, and stuff like that. Thoughts on that? Okay. Um, I can go on then, Daniel. <clears throat> um, having one foot in academia and one foot in activism, <clears throat> it enables me to witness, for example, a month ago, I was in a workshop on food uh, sovereignty, which is the mantra of Via Campesina, the largest peasant small farmer organization in the world. Um, <clears throat> and there were people from all over Spain, <clears throat> mostly young people, some veterans. I think I may have been the oldest. <laughs> Um, and it was very well organized about the topic, but also it had an element I was not aware of, an element of civil disobedience. It was a school in civil disobedience. So I said, wow. And it was so good that I spoke with the organizers. Maybe if they can jump the barrier of language, they could do training. I'm sure there are people in Sweden doing that kind of training, civil disobedience being one of the ways to protest nonviolent that um, may in the long range be more successful than violent revolutions. So that's one example. It was very inspiring. Uh, a week before, in 
uh, as furthermore, they had a meeting organized, uh, summer kind of meeting uh, by Friends of the Earth, where we had some local activism or national from Sweden, also European branch, they're working at the European level, and is the largest international environmental justice organization. And the quality, the seriousness, the commitment, I kind of joke and I said, now I can die in peace because you are there to continue the job that we veterans ha have been doing and it's time to have you take over. I was very impressed. I jokingly asked them if they would accept me. They said, no, the maximum age is 30. I'm 82, so I was out. But um, so good things are happening. They are not reported by media. Some social media would report about them. Uh, yesterday we met with Daniel. There is the first world climate meeting activism in Milano in Italy. So we might try to do something with it. To, because uh, what happens, Ryan, one can be very isolated or feel very isolated being in this kind of ivory tower, you know, university town like Uppsala. But there's a lot going on. And just one example, which is important. Uh, the president of Via Campesina, uh, for many years, was Rafael Alegria in Honduras, a very violent country. But with the current government, it's a woman, he's now the vice minister of agriculture. So... That's a possibility when social movements have possibility to influence policy. But I don't have any hope that Putin or Xi or Biden or 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 Sunak, Sunak or or Macron will take us anywhere out of this hole. I see them more as part of the problem. Call it bi or multi. Uh, 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 poly, uh, uh, polycentrum. Uh, I put my trust and my hope in social movements and social movements are not panaceas, they are not perfect, they are human organizations with human errors and deficiencies and incoherencies, incongruities, sometimes perfectism, you know, political correctness. So, The next World Social Forum will be in Nepal next year. And in Nepal, uh, one of the leaders from Via Campesina is has not the ministry, but it's well located in the Ministry of Agriculture. So s s things seem to be happening, uh, are happening. People are not giving up. Let's say today in, in uh, Guatemala, We were mobilized because the corrupt people in power are trying to eliminate the last elections. And this is a revolo, this is a party. I, uh, and people are, are in the streets. In Peru, we're, we're almost back to corrupt fascism in the 90s. People are still pressed by post COVID syndromes and terror. Um, and this schizophrenia that colonial countries have, internal colonies. Lima is like the capital, but Lima looks outside more than inside. Okay? So, uh, that would be a fast answer to your difficult question. Um, I think from my perspective, um, I think there's a dwindling number of countries that are called like full democracies. And that is also in itself not the ideal state of, of affairs, but that's under 10%. It might be even under going <laughs> nearer towards under 5%. So there's a very small portion of the world's countries where people like us or people in this room could exist and doing the work that we're doing freely enough. Uh, so I'm having a hard time seeing what is CMS and an independent enough university exists in another context. Uh, what happens uh, if you have a, 
American political system, not the current one or not the current administration, but Trump or something worse. How does things work out for us in this part the of the new world? Roman Empire. Yeah, <laughs> and also uh, for me, growing up during the Cold War and seeing the the fall of the Berlin Wall and and the protests in the Tiananmen Square in uh, Beijing, um, it's very strong a very strong sense of of not wanting to live in a Soviet or Russian dominated Europe, not wanting to live in a Chinese Communist Party dominated system or world. They um, call it market socialism. <laughs> yeah, market <laughs> socialism and beyond. Uh, but if you pair those kind um, of Cold War, mostly emotions, but also like seeing things on the TV, you pair that with where we are now in the world with surveillance technology and other technologies, um, even if the Russian invasion of Ukraine can be said to be a failure, that doesn't mean that the Russian colonial ambitions in Europe are ending or have ended. So for me, it's it's uh, we have this small space, we have an historical space or a moment where we can actually do a lot of things. Um, and that kind of, yeah, to do as many things as we possibly can do now. But I think also with working with these issues, it's been empowering as a worn out word and it just becomes thrown out there. But if you translate that to something more tangible and something more active, it's making people see that they can make or they can do good work in the here and now, kind of not be too focused on the future, not drift into past or or distant kind of futures and and try to see and because there's so many different things we can do and if we only talk and get lost in this impossibilities of of dystopias or whatever it is we're not going to get anything done and just starting here if you just want to be active and do something there's so many things in just the small space that is CMS as well of things we could do uh, or things that are enabled by being at Uppsala University. Thank yes, you so much, Asriel. This Thank was interesting. You, uh, as always, it's a long conversation. We've been going on for <laughs> one hour and 20 minutes. You have tea there as well. That's cold now <laughs> if you want something for your voice. Um, but interesting to do it in this format. I'm realizing when we sat down as well, we should have had a table maybe facing each other, but then we're not facing people listening. So, yeah, we'll try to figure that out next time. Great. Thank you, Daniel. And hopefully... People can listen to this yes. podcast and then get feedback from them. Yep. But uh, people are informed in different parts of, of the world mm -hmm. about this podcast. For me, it was news, um, fun to dialogue, um, to have a space where we can think and speak freely for the time being. <laughs>